Good morning. I'm Bonnie Gardner. I'm co-chair of the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. We're located at 4700 Grover Avenue. We encourage you to attend our forums. They're usually almost every Sunday at noon. Our mission is to nurture the mind and the spirit and serve social justice. If you want to hear more about our public affairs forums, you can go to our website at www.austinuu.org. And now Dr. Jake Agarwal is going to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Tom McCourse. Dr. Agarwal. Uh, it is a, it's a pleasure and a distinct honor for me to introduce Dr. Tom McCourse. Uh, he's a friend a neighbor, and my doctor. If I may add, Tom is patient's doctor. Dr. McCourse is a board-certified doctor. He is a former U.S. Air Force captain. He has been past president of Travis County Medical Society. Uh, he was named Physician of the Year uh, in 2012. Further, he received the Jordan Award from Travis County Medical Society in 2002 for his community service. He's a highly qualified to talk about health care since he is a practicing physician as well as a retired physician. I'm happy to present Dr. Tom McCars. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jake. Uh, I appreciate Jake and the committee asking me to be here. I chose the handout that you have here today as opposed to a PowerPoint based on the concept, if you're like me, tomorrow you'll say, boy, he made three good points. It was one, two, and pull a Rick Perry and say, I can't remember what that third one was. So, so I hope this is helpful to you when you get away from here. And uh, I'm understanding the format to be that I'll talk for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for uh, questions. A little bit of background, just in case your feeble memories are like mine. Despite the fact that everything that's been written, everything that's been said, every bills have been introduced in Congress, it's only been since March of 2010 that the Affordable Care Act passed. And remember that even though we haven't, they haven't instituted all the components of it, it's only this past January of 2014 that, in essence, the heart of the plan was introduced. So in terms of evaluating its uh, effectiveness, evaluating its usefulness, seeing truly how much it costs, uh, all of those things are kind of to be determined. And hopefully, as I'll mention at the end, the benefits of it, that is, in terms of quality, and cost reduction. But a little bit of quick review that's covered in item one. How does health care get paid for in your county, that is Travis County? Uh, the obvious one that we all think of is employer provided uh, health insurance or you as an individual may have uh, purchased insurance on your own. Since January of 2000, actually since the fall of about a year ago, you of course the introduction of the marketplace exchanges which is one of the hearts of the Affordable Care Act. But taking all of those aspects, that's what I've termed here commercial insurance. I won't ask how many to raise your hand are on Medicare at this point, but I am, so I do speak from uh, some clarity on that. Now remember, when we talk about the fact a little bit later that about 50% of health care in this country is paid for through government funding, well, of course, you and I are, are contributing to our Medicare but there is money that comes out of the general fund for that, in addition to, of course, the total outlay that goes with Medicaid, and we'll talk about some others. Uh, Medicaid has been a lot in the news, more than most of you were aware, and the reason for that is because as part of the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid was being extended to many people who didn't qualify. In other words, they raised the guidelines uh, for how poor you had to be to qualify or loosen them, I guess would be a better word. Texas, as we're aware, did not choose, as long with, all, with many other states, to participate in that, and that has some mega effects uh, further down the line. Sliding scale clinics, that's largely uh, the 
ones that have listed people, Seton, Lone Star, Circle of Care, all of these kind of fit into federal qualified programs. Uh, the Central Health, which you remember the Travis County Health Care District that passed back in 2004 has changed names two or three times and it's now called Central Health. But the Medical Assistance or MAP program is through there, Community Care Clinics. Those are clinics that are basically the county government supplies the funds to make those go. And of course the county government is obviously our tax money. Uh, charitable clinics, a volunteer health care clinic that I've been involved with for a long time. Project Access is through the Travis County Medical Society. That is a primary and a specialty home for a number of people. And then there's that great group of people you're always hearing about, those who show up in the emergency room or hospitalized who are totally unfunded. And we'll talk a little later about who funds those. And then remember, if you have some money but are not insured, then that doesn't mean you can take a walk on your health care bills. You still will be chased down, and you've heard of everything from people having uh, bankruptcy related to that. But if you have the ability to pay something, then that uh, is included. But I thought it would be helpful to think about what happens. In it. And then we're going to see how the Affordable Care Act has affected some of these various sources. Remember what the original goals of the original Affordable Care Act were? They're listed on number two. And I want to emphasize a couple of the words that I have written down. In the increased quality and affordability of health insurance. Now, I didn't say health care, did I? I said the health insurance. Remember that uh, up until 2014, you might have a health insurance plan that didn't pay for mental health care, didn't cover the emergency room, even though you thought you were buying that, may or may not have variable coverage for medications. So it's there are under Affordable Health Care, or the ACA, there are certain basic benefits that I'll mention in a moment that have to be included. And for that reason, a number of plans that used to be offered are no longer offered because they didn't meet that basic guideline. So uh, those are examples of things that have been uh, standardized is a good word. Number B is lower the uninsured rate by expanding public and private insurance. How many people in the United States before 2014 were uninsured? Of course, Texas, of course, what, leads the nation? Certainly, we lead it in lots of things, and that's one of them, uh, is that. So, thought to be about 24, I'm sorry, uh, 6 to 8 million Texans were uninsured, at least 25%. In Travis County, it's somewhere between 18 and 20 percent of our citizens had no form of health insurance. But obviously, that was this, the main thrust of the uh, Obama administration was to expand health care. Reduce the cost of health care for individuals and government. Why is the government interested in reducing the cost of health care? Well, you've heard enough like how much of the GDP, gross domestic product, health care cost. Back when Phil was young, it was about 10 or 12 percent. Now it's about 18 percent of the gross product. So the whole point is it's felt that if it continued like this, it may well come close to bankrupting us. Remember what I said? 50 percent of health care in this country right now, between Medicare, Medicaid, and the other various programs, is paid for out of the general government. And maybe in context of this forum, the idea that I've mentioned there, the ethical issue, it's been well demonstrated that people who are uninsured have a higher mortality rate. Does that make sense in a country as uh, prosperous as the U.S.? Well, obviously they're the very rich, they're the vast middle class, they're the relatively poor, and then there's the, the very dirt poor. And certainly people who are uninsured die earlier uh, in their lives and are sicker because they don't have ready access. And they can get care, but it usually is an emergency room setting. So I hope that uh, outlining that, back to the uninsured. As of 2009, there were 47 million, 47 million U.S. citizens that were not insured. Do you know what the third most populous country in the world is? I was surprised when I looked it up. Obviously, everybody knows China. Everybody knows India. This is your pearl for the day. The U.S. is actually the third most populous country in the world with our current population of about 317 million people. And you figure that when you're talking about up to 20% are uninsured, 
that's a whole lot of folks who don't have access to care. Uh, remember also that why don't they have access to care? One, they're poor and can't afford it. Two, they work generally for a small business that doesn't offer that, and buying it individually is possible, but used to be much, much, much more expensive. Uh, so it's really the lower income folks and those who work for small business. Because remember, every politician in the world, and this is not meant to be a negative statement, says, the whole essence of our economy is what? Small business. Well, that's all great, but small businesses don't offer a lot of the benefits. If, you, in fact, under this law, if you have a co company that is under 50 employees, under 50 employees, you are not required by the Affordable Care Act to provide health insurance. Some companies do that, partly to be good citizens, partly it helps them to attract and keep workers. But everything we're going to talk about does not apply if you're an employer with less than 50 employees. And I won't get into full-time, half-time, part-time. That gets to be more complexities than I wish we were in a place to be. Okay, how, is, how, how did, uh, we'll just say, uh, for lack, I, I don't like the word, but for lack of ease and communication, let's just call it Obamacare. But how did the Obama administration decide to go about to solve the problems we've talked about, improve the quality of health insurance, get the uninsured rate to an acceptable level, reduce the cost, and the ethical issue? Well, number one, the obvious one that what? Has had more published than anything else under 3A. Individual mandates requiring everyone to buy or have insurance. Uh, that's a, a very desirable thing. It, here you can argue about it and it's in the legal system. But the point is that's one way of accomplishing it is to require or to be excluded for everybody to have health insurance. Obviously, there have been some major legal challenges to that. The limited sign-up period is a little bit of a challenge. And obviously, Congress, I believe the House of Representatives has passed, somebody correct me, like 40 times has passed a bill saying, do we want to repeal uh, Obamacare? And obviously, it didn't go past the Senate and certainly wouldn't have gotten past the White House. But the point is, there's a continuing rhetoric on that subject. Uh, so that's number one, one approach. Number two is, how do you get people to sign up? The key is individual coverage in the past has cost how much? 20, 30 percent more than your IBM insurance or whatever company you work for, Doug. <laughs> but the whole point being that individual policies, and that's one of the things that's gone with the Affordable Care Act, is the cost of me buying a health insurance policy on an individual basis, in other words, the marketplaces, has come down to the same level. Small businesses used to have that same problem. They would be offering health insurance, but it still would cost them 20 percent more than if you worked for a big employer. So you can see the sense of inequities. Insurance companies could justify that on an administrative basis, and a lot of voodoo uh, probably is what it really came down to. But at any rate, that's it. But what happened to the exchanges? Yes, everybody knows about government. Doctrine, but as the bill was set up, all 50 states were asked to set up what? State-run exchanges. How many did? 23 states uh, did. 27 said, no, we don't want to do that. For a variety of reasons, it's not pertinent to today. So you had the federal government, i.e., uh, the health care uh, system that uh, has set, was set up to handle these people. Has it worked? Eight million people signed up through healthcare.gov. So that's not bad. What is good? Obviously, that's a long way from however many are uninsured. But do remember that some eight million people. Now, an interesting fact about that, remember, we talked about, or I'm sorry, I'll talk about in a moment, the fact that if you're under 400% of federal poverty guidelines, which for a family of four is about $50,000 a year, you could qualify for a graded amount of subs premium subsidy. So if you made $28,000 a year, $30,000 a year was your income for a family of four, you would get a lot of subsidy money. If you made 48000 you would still get subsidy money but just obviously not as much. 85% of the folks who signed up for the health exchanges through the various uh, exchanges from this past year qualified for subsidy. So do you think that the program reached those who were previously uninsured and who felt they were too poor to it? In that sense, yes, if that 85% of those who signed up. As we'll talk in a minute, did they start paying their regular premiums? 
perhaps a different story. Federal subsidies for legal residents. Why did I say legal residents there? If you're an undocumented, you choose the word you like. I like the word undocumented, immigrant, illegal immigrant, whatever. If you're in that category, which is somewhere between eight and a million people who live eight sorry, eight and eleven million people who live in this country, can you get any of this health care stuff? No. Do you qualify for Medicaid? No. So the point is that is wonderful in some people's eyes, and mostly mine, I should hasten to add, as the Affordable Care Act has been, it totally doesn't touch uh, the young documented. So places like the Volunteer Health Care Clinic and, to their credit, the MAP program, Medical Assistance Program in the city, do help take care of these people. But again, the restrictions on their income is pretty huge. What we typically talk about is the working poor. So you, you signed up for your program. You get some subsidy of seeing this, it, that it is helpful to you. So we've, again, added about 8 million people uh, to that list. A real heart and soul part of the Affordable Care Act was what? Expansion of Medicaid. First, and we have a couple people in the audience who know a whole lot about uh, Medicaid, but let me can't you, if you live in New York State, if your income is like 135% of federal poverty guidelines, you qualify, and below, of course, you qualify. If you live in Texas and are not pregnant and not a child, about 30% federal poverty guidelines. If you're below that, you have Medicaid. If you make 60, 70, uh, if your income for a family of four is, say, $20,000 a year, you did not qualify for Medicaid in Texas. So lots of variation from state to state is what I've, so if you want to go on Medicaid, pick the right state to live in, okay? That's, that's real important. So under the Affordable Care Act, the whole country raised the rate for Medicare or the qualifications for Medicaid to 138 percent. Includes lots of people. But again, uh, about half the states in the country chose not to do that. The way that was set up is that for the first three years, 2014 through 16, the federal government would pay the entire cost of that program. And then over the next four years, it would wind down a little so that the feds would still pay 90 percent and the local governments, meaning the state, would pay 10%. And as best I understand it, that's basically why the state of Texas decided not to. We didn't want to obligate ourselves to that. Who's going to take care and who's going to pay for the health care cost of those folks between here and here? To be continued, we'll find that out. Okay, so real important for probably approaching the moon. What the Affordable Care Act did also was guarantee that if you had pre-existing illness, you could be insured. See if, if I had uh, significant hypertension and had two heart attacks. If I went to buy an individual policy, if I could buy it at all, my premium would be about three times above the standard. That has all been wiped out so that if that same person I've just described now pays the same rate as a person who's as healthy as Doug is, I guess. But the whole point being that uh, it guarantees that. The other thing, even though you ran up a big health care bill last year, for instance, you had cancer, you may be cured, but you could not get a health care policy uh, within any reasonable amount of money if you had health cancer last year under the Affordable Care Act. Again, that disqualification, if you'll use that, has been done away with. So pre-existing illness, portability, prior cost are all things that have been done away with with the new insurance. And this applies to all. This doesn't just apply to people through the exchanges. It applies to all of other programs. What about doctors? Nobody's mentioned them, have they? Don't we have some role in all this as much as to a large extent the uh, American medical community was kind of fighting in terms? Well, what's been, what uh, physicians are supposed to do and have been mandated to do, I should hasten to add, is to create more medical homes. What that means is there are more of us that need to have a primary care doctor, particularly about those in poor health, so somebody's actually managing your care besides yourself. I'm fond of saying that I think every patient ought to have an advocate. Well, a lot of that's a friend or family, but your primary care doctor ought to be your advocate as you work through the system. So more medical homes are primary. Uh, the electronic health record. Has everybody been to the doctor's office and the doctor's down doing this and so that you can't? Oh, yeah, you're here, aren't you? Uh, unfortunately, the health record has tended to make it so 
that in communicating with you, the doctor sometimes is paying more attention to the electronic record than he is to understanding you. Uh, that's just the way life is. I don't think it's a good development, but the idea behind electronic health records is so that records can be shared, which at this point they're not very well shared, uh, and allow there to be non-duplication of so many things that are done in our current system. Uh, and also, be blunt about it, and one of the reasons that physicians are not as excited as we would hope they would be about this, it's built in that they're going to get paid less for seeing you, okay? And you see physicians who say, I'm not going to take care of a person whose health insurance is through one of these exchanges. Well, if you have a standard Blue Cross policy, and these are just arbitrary numbers, then I get paid $100 for your first visit to me. If it's Medicare, it's probably about $80. But the key is with some of these health exchange programs, I'm still getting only $80 or maybe 90 so why should I fill up my waiting room with people who've gotten their health insurance through an exchange at 80 bucks a, a visit when in Austin, Texas, with all the growth and the prosperity, I can fill up my waiting room where people are paying me $100 a visit? How smart a businessman does it take to figure out what you're going to do? So you can understand to some extent physicians' reluctance to make this transition. They're still taking care of the standard Blue Cross, but see, Blue Cross has also sold policies through the exchanges, which some physicians' offices don't take because, again, of reimbursement. So I'm hopefully creating a little bit of sense of understanding, whether you agree or not, but understanding of why physicians' offices may not uh, do some of these things. Okay, we've said that we have this bright new policy. It has come around in starting in January of 2014. Uh, sounds pretty good on paper, doesn't it? Lots, lots of aspects are on the paper. But who's left? Who is the residual uninsured is the term that I use in that. Well, we've gone with all these new changes with the Affordable Care Act from 20% of the U.S. population being uninsured to about 14 to 15%. So we've covered 20 million people. Again, it debates which figures you believe. 15 to 20 billion more, I mean million more but we still have about 30 million standing around with no health insurance of any kind, government or private. Have we solved the problem? Has the Affordable Care Act solved that problem of the uninsured? It's made a dent in it, but it certainly hasn't. So the un who fits under this category? Undocumented Im immigrants, as I've already told you, don't qualify for any of this. And that's somewhere between 8 and 11 million, depending on the figures you believe. They don't qualify for Medicaid under most circumstances. They don't qualify for any subsidies. Uh, those have just chosen not to enroll. You know, everybody's not just running out and buying it. So those people are certainly not included. Uh, if your insurance premium, even with subsidies, accounts for more than 8% of your gross income, then you don't have to buy health insurance. It's not clear what you're supposed to do, but you don't have to under the government mandate to do that. Remember I said gross income. So if your take-home pay is, like most people, is about 75% of their gross, that 8% suddenly is 16 or 18%. So you can see why people in this category can't, and were exempted, I should hasten to add. And then the real big sad thing is, uh, as I put in uh, 4D, citizens and states opting out of Medicare expansion, which throughout the country is about 5.4 million, uh, they're just left with no ability to get health care because in their states, the states that accepted uh, the federal dollars to expansion of Medicaid uh, have added a lot more people, as you might have guessed, but there's still about 5.84 million who had Texas and had a lot of the other states concluded uh, would be on the Medicaid rolls. Not here to discuss whether that's bad or good. Any idea how many people in this country are covered by Medicaid before the Affordable Care Act? Okay, I've told you there are 311 or 317 million Americans, didn't I? Before this came along, 59 million people were on the Medicaid program. So that's the good news. The bad news is that's 59 million people who either are too poor or don't have access to any private health insurance programs. Pretty astounding if you really put it into hard numbers. 59 million, and that has risen to 2 million people on Medicaid 
with all the programs we've been talking about. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of the residual uninsured. Okay, what's been accomplished? How did we accomplish the things? And that's where I said on the handout, go back to uh, the look of item three. The mandates uh, have worked by and large. Again, eight million people have signed up. What's expected this fall, remember it opens up again in November and goes through January, is probably another six or eight million people will sign up for health insurance through the exchanges or rebid it. So the, the long term is expected, the projections are about 2017, that at least 20, maybe more people, million people will be signed up for their health insurance through these exchanges that we keep talking about. So that's, that's the method that's working there. Uh, these individual policies, they're really, really good ideas, and they work. But let's say that my income is, uh, we'll just choose a number, but $45,000 a year, family of four. I've got my health insurance. That's really great. And as I'll put, remember that there is something called deductibles. And even if you're in the private insurance world over the last five to even ten years, what's happened to your deductible? It's gone up. Why has it gone up? That's one way of controlling the cost of the premium. So I can give you all the benefits you want. I can give you uh, almost no deductible, no copay when you go to the doctor's office. You'd think you're on Medicare uh, kind of thing. But the premium is up here. So that's the reason that I can give you all your benefits. It's just tell me how much is an insurance company you're willing to pay me. So how do you deal with that? That's why they pay physicians less for these other, other parts of the care, when I was talking about the exchange stuff, uh, is because they reduce the premium by reducing, in essence, the benefits. Fortunately, there's this floor on benefits. And preventable health care. What is a preventable health care? What are the services that you all think of as, quote, preventable health care? Immunizations, right, mammograms. My favorite subject, colonoscopies. Uh, but seriously, those that were by a particular committee made the decision, those have no copay under any of the new health insurance programs, no copay at all, and so they're fully covered. That's really good if our goal is to improve the amount, number of people who take full advantage of the affordable uh, aspects of their care. So that has moved apart. I've already talked about the fact that uh, that so many people on the exchanges t have taken advantage of the subsidies. Interesting. Remember, this is a group of people who probably have not had health insurance before, right? So they don't quite understand it. Uh, lots of skeptics were saying, okay, you're signing them up, but they're going to pay their premium. At least the first couple of months, about 85% of people paid their first premium. So not bad. Uh, I don't know what a norm should be. But the whole point is that at least we were able to teach the people who are new to the insurance world. They might not understand anything about their benefits, but at least they paid their premium, which, of course, is pretty critical. And that's, again, one of the problems physicians have is if people quit paying their premium, they're still on the bills, and the doctor sees them in good faith and then can't bill for them. Now, they do have ways of trying to check, but those are not all real-time uh, effects. What, there are four levels of subsidies in plants. Uh, and I won't ask how many of you might be on the exchange, but you can buy a <coughs> bronze plan. And remember back to my point about deductibles? First, there's the deductible. But a bronze plan pays essentially 60% of all your health costs. Remember the last time that you went for any health care and you had your MRI of the, of the brain because of your fainting spell? Uh, that's only for old folks who know anything about that. But, uh, you know, that's $1,500. Well, again, if you're just having to pay 40% of some of these things, even, as, even after your deductible, that's a lot of money. And so lots of folks think. So if you bought a bronze plan, and this is detailed out on the website, then it pays approximately 60%. If you bought a silver plan, which is the most popular, it pays about 70% of your cost. If you bought a gold plan, it pays about 80% of your medical cost. And if you brought a platinum plan, it pays about 90%. Of course, obviously, the premiums are higher. Back to that principle I mentioned. I can take care of anything you need if you're willing to pay me. So, Now, one of the interesting things that also was part of the Affordable Care Act was the insurance companies. 
That is to say, they could basically have to use at least 80% of their premium dollars for taking care of people, which was well publicized. In other words, they could have 20% for administrative and profit and all that kind of stuff. But if best I read it, that expires in 2016. Now, so lots of publicity. Look how good guys we are. We're sending you guys back some premium money. But that requirement, for whatever the reason, seems to drop it. And most of these things that seem so weird to us, why are they in there? Negotiation. You know, this interest group says, I'll support most of your program if you'll give me this uh, concession. Right? So those are the, the aspects that, that go with it. Uh, but let me give you one other thing. What other things were new, and I should have mentioned this earlier, with health insurance? So number one, no lifetime limits. Many policies that I mentioned before, if you went over 200000 or a million dollars, you were no longer covered. Well, with all these new insurance policies, and yours too, the ones you bought from your employer or with your employer's help, no lifetime limits. We've already talked about pre-existing disease. Uh, coverage for preventable aspects. In theory, the language in your health care policy is clearer. Haven't you all noticed that already? I don't hear this groundswell of yes. The whole point is that is part of it is a clear thing. Uh, an important thing if you have college-age kids is they can now stay on your own your health insurance problem until they're up 26. Big step problem. Probably one to two million people this year qualified under that aspect. Uh, and then, of course, the premium assistance we've talked about. So what we've said so far, then, is the original goals, and I hope I've outlined what they have been. We've talked about the strategy to get there. We've talked about uh, who is not covered by any of these things. Uh, let's quickly turn uh, to the challenges that are before the Affordable Care Act, uh, as well as quickly talk about the future. Now. I'm sorry to jump around, but there were four deadlines that were very important as of January 1st of this year. Those one is, that's when what I've just talked about, the guaranteed issue and essential benefits went into effect. So, again, those have only been in effect since the 1st of January of 2014. The individual mandate kicked in then, insurance purchase support, that is subsidies, and the expansion of Medicaid. So all of these are less than 10 months old in terms of the really sort of biggies uh, that are part of the affordable care gap. Things like making the, your employer uh, to cover your health insurance. If you're a big employer, that's been put back a year or so. But, so what are the challenges, at least in Tom McCorse's view of the world? The marketplace's exchanges are only open from November to January. So, barring something really catastrophic, uh, you can't sign up for anything between now and then. Now, if you lose your insurance, if your other insurance is canceled, you can go into insurance. But by and large, again, they're just open to the period of time we talked about. Does every doctor in Austin, Texas accept uh, Medicaid? Does every doctor in Austin, Texas accept uh, the exchange programs? Well, I've already told you why a lot don't. The other thing aspect, in addition to reimbursement, is something called narrowed networks. Have you picked up that word from the news? That basically means that if and these are examples, not, not hard data, please understand that. But if you bought an insurance through the exchanges, in other words, these 8 million people in the country, bought a Blue Cross the, or any of the others, I just use that, is the biggest uh, dominating factor in Texas, although United is close behind. Uh, but if you bought, bought those uh, within the, in the past year, then in addition to the fact that the doctor doesn't get paid as much, only certain doctors are on that network. So you can only go to Seton Hospital or you could only go to St. David's depending on which policy you buy. And that means you only could see certain doctors. So even though you have a bright, shiny new health insurance program, you may be limited in where you can go for your care and who you can see for your care. Uh, and that's, that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, the large deductibles I've already made. Let me give you an example. If you have a private health insurance program, okay, Again, I'm picking on IBM, which I guess is no longer the gold standard by a long shot. But your average deductible is about $1,200 a year for most policies. If you have a bronze plan, again, through the exchanges, your deductible averages in this country $5,100 a year. If you have a silver plan, it's about $2,900. Well, again, if you have, this is not, as one lady said uh, 
in the article that was on the front page of the New York Times yesterday, you know, where am I supposed to get this money from? I'm keeping it in my mattress, obviously. So the whole point behind what I'm saying is that these large deductibles for people of the lower incomes are minor disasters. There's not a way around it, is there, unless they all get the higher plans, which means cost more money, which means more subsidy dollars. The residual uninsured, particularly in a place like Texas, somebody has to take care of those folks. Currently, I'm sorry, before 2014, if you got sick and went to BRAC, to use an example, and couldn't pay, then there are actually some federal dollars that go to low-income hospitals. Because we have all these new health insurance programs, one way of saving money to help pay for it is what? To shrink those dollars that go to Brackenridge for the uninsured. But we've still got lots of insured. Uh, it'll take time to see if we're really saving money. How are we going to pay for all this? Well, one, we're going to reduce the cost of care to the government by programs that we'll mention in a moment. Number two, people are going to be less sick. Isn't that a good idea? It is a good idea. How are they going to do that? They're going to get more preventive services. When you're discharged from the hospital, uh, we're going to decrease your chance of going back to the hospital, which is called readmission rates. And in general, we're going to try to make you guys healthier by stopping your smoking. That's not a big deal anymore, at least in certain populations. But how about your caloric intake? Whatever benefits we gain, and this is editorial, and I'll admit that, by stopping smoking will probably be evened out by what? Obesity. Okay? So we're getting better in one area. Uh, to say the least, we're losing ground in the other. So, you know, we doctors are going to be in business for a long time. No, uh, no worries about that. Okay, real quickly, under, uh, under future. Uh, reduce the cost of medical care, reduce the percentage of the GDP. Uh, again, that's to be proven over the next four to five years by decreasing duplication, reducing the cost of certain tests. How about end-of-life care? Uh, that's a toughie and is well outside this, this presentation, although it might be a subject for you to talk about with somebody who knows more than I about it. But, you know, you go into the hospital had a major stroke, you can't talk, or you've come out of the nursing home and uh, thing you're sick to death, you're in the ICU, continuing to spend whatever it amounts per day, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a day, and the chance of you're getting better is one percent. Okay? If I invest asked you to invest in a company where there's a ninety nine percent chance that you were going to lose money on your investment, a one percent chance that you were not going to lose money but probably wouldn't make a lot, and about a quarter of a tenth of a percent that you'd make a lot, meaning the person we're talking about suddenly gets up and walks out. Uh, that's tough to talk about it when it's your relative or you yourself. But if you look at it from a wider point of view, uh, there's a lot to say that for end-of-life care, we could at least control the cost. The other thing to be very critical of physicians, there are a number of treatment options that have not been proven. Uh, some of the hardware that's put in backs, and I don't mean to be critical of anybody who's had a back operation and has had hardware in there, but that's an example. Or drugs that, that are of not marginal value, those are things where the medical profession needs to do its part. Okay? Uh, we've got increased participation if we're going to make this thing work. I say we, it uh, doesn't have anything to do with me, but obviously we need more people on Medicaid. We've got to get rid of that 15% of our population that's not covered. Okay? Uh, that Medicare expansion, uh, those who look at the history of government programs uh, tend to say that eventually even Texas might join Medicaid. Uh, and it doesn't matter who's elected governor on that state. Uh, but the whole point is that probably because there's so much money out there and we're in such need of the health care dollars that probably even Texas and most will. And then there are, of course, the legal challenges. Have any of you paid attention to the fact that one U.S. court says that if you get your medical subsidy for your health insurance program through a federal exchange, that it's not going to count. If it's through a state exchange, it will. And this comes down to some small wording in the law that was somebody's misstep. But one federal court says yes, one federal court says no. So that's to be decided. And, of course, obviously, depending on the elections, there will be continued congressional challenge. So what I hope I've done here is to outline for you the fact that it is new and different. It's a long way from saying this is going to work. It's probably going to stay 
because there are certain parts of it that we think are really, really helpful, like keeping your kid until he's 26, uh, some of the subsidy stuff, what people dislike, of course, the mandates, et cetera. But hopefully the quality of medicine will improve with these efforts, and uh, the cost of medicine will come down. And, of course, those two facts sometimes go hand in hand. So I think uh, we'll stop and go into the uh, question and answer stuff. Thank you, Dr. McCorse. Uh, since I have the microphone, I'm going to ask a question. I am a practicing psychologist, and one of, uh, one of the things I've noticed is that my uh, fees have gone down almost consistently since the early and mid-1990s. Um, these are insurance fees. At the same time, recently in the last couple of years, my patients' co-pays have gone up. Now, presumably insurance companies are making a lot of money because they're selling more policies and they're also federally subsidized, some of them, the policies. And we read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and it says the insurance companies have record profits. It would seem that the money is going largely to the insurance companies and what are your thoughts on the need for better regulation? I understand now they're supposed to spend 80% uh, on actual service delivery, but I keep wondering, um, isn't more money kind of going their direction than, than our direction? Well, the question is obviously a good one, and she's outlined very clearly what not just the psychologist office feels, although mental health folks are in a bigger pickle on that than uh, the average uh, medical office, but it's a real thing. I don't know the easy answer to that. I'm going to hide behind the fact that that new cancer drug now costs $1,000 a pill, the fact that we're spending so much more on new technology, new treatment. So that's where I think the insurance company, to some extent, could argue, hey, no, I'm not covering the things you've alluded to, but we really are covering these really biggy, biggy things. And it is true. I'm in the gastroenterologist. You perhaps have read that there's a new pill to treat Hepatitis C, and that's really, really good. It costs a thousand dollars a pill for three months. That's really, really bad. Uh, so the whole point is that the money is in the system, as you've appropriately pointed out, and is going up. But the providers are feeling really pinched along those lines, and uh, there is some stuff in the Affordable Care Act to help that. But you know, the creativity of the American businessman. Uh, is such that I'm not sure how much indentation. And so the bottom line is don't expect any more improvement in your, your fees. Well, I won't. Uh, this is actually kind of a follow-on to Bonnie's question. Uh, I travel to Europe fairly frequently in business, and so I have some knowledge of the European healthcare care systems. If you take France, they pay 40% less per GDP than the U.S. does, and they have uh, universal health care coverage. Could you comment on your thoughts regarding the advantages and disadvantages of either single payer or some sort of government option at, to replace private uh, insurance companies? In 30 seconds or 30 hours? No, your point is obviously you, you all have heard this. Let me, let me tell you one little fact, and then I'll try to answer your question. This is a pretty good study. It was done by a professor at Carnegie Mellon that you take France, Spain, the U.K., the, the Norwegian companies, uh, countries, not Norwegian, I'm Scandinavian countries, and the cost of health care, although it's higher in the U.S., it's not drastically higher. It's, you know, here, until the age of 62. And the U.S. costs skyrockets. Part of that is what we spend on us older people. Uh, you know, a new hip, a new knee, treating cancer when you're 96 years old. And I don't say that is good or bad, but part of it has to do with the amount of money that our system fills later. The basic problem is, though, compared to a European system or most any, any place else, we pay our health care providers a lot more. I mean, the income is, is higher. The drugs cost enormously more for reasons I have no honest clue. Yes, there's liability insurance, and yes, there are developmental costs, but I have no clue why drugs are so expensive. And then we also waste things. So the big message is we charge more, we reimburse the providers more, uh, that everything inherently within the system has risen in cost. Uh, yes, liability plays some role, and that's real, but that's not the biggie. It's basically how much you spend on the various components, and I can't justify any of it. 
what did the Affordable Care Act, uh, what impact did it have on controlling pharmaceutical companies being able to just arbitrarily, you know, decide any cost, you know, to the moon is what they can charge for their drugs. And then also, um, are, for westernized countries, is there any country that charges more than we do for administrative billing, paperwork, et cetera? And are there any other countries that are better uh, role models in what we could move towards in not wasting all that paper and administration and billing, it's more streamlining? Medicare cost about 3 to 5% is their administrative overhead. Remember we talked about you cap the private carriers at 20% of administrative overhead. So it's certainly doable in this country if you adjust for administrative cost, advertising cost, shareholder cost. I don't know how that 20% all breaks down. But Medicare, actually, its overhead is closer to about 5%. Uh, as far as I know, we're the most expensive in every category. The cost for an operation, the cost for the... A uh, little vignette, I don't think we'll run out of time, at the Volunteer Health Care Clinic, which is for indigent folks uh, who don't qualify for any of these government programs. I was seeing a, a man who had immigrated in from Vietnam about a year ago, and he had two diseases. He had a chronic uh, liver infection, and he had back pain. And I started to go into a history, and all of a sudden he whips out this MRI of his spine that he had gotten in Vietnam, and then he also told me all these expensive tests for his uh, hepatitis that he had had. And I said, well, how much did those cost? Oh, this was a, the MRI was 100, and all these drug costs, were, I mean, the testing was like 60 bucks. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and then I said, how much did it cost to fly back to Vietnam? $2,200. So he could come out way ahead to fly to Vietnam, have these done, and come back only to over-illustrate the point you made. I don't know the answer to you question as much as I wish I did, but we do charge more. It's mixed into lots of factors that are beyond the scope of my knowledge. And probably, as I used to say before the Affordable Care Act came out, I don't think any human being is smart enough to figure out the right answers to all this and certainly to understand that. So I don't mean to not answer. I just don't think there's a clear answer that Tom can understand, can, can enumerate on. But yes, we lead the pack and all of those things. Uh, real quick, you've heard the stories, not stories, the data, about our infant mortality not being the lowest. How could that be? I mean, we've got neonatal ICUs, we've got da-da-da-da. A lot of the answers is our lack of prenatal care. So much of our indigent population does not get adequate prenatal care. So they are born with sicker babies. I mean, they bear sicker babies who die. And that's why instead of being first or second as we ought to be, you know, I think what we're 14th or 15th the last time I read. Uh, so the whole point is there's some chinks in the system, such as providing preventive care, universal immunizations to get on that kick, uh, can make huge differences in our overall health and reduce the cost of care. This is a little off the subject, but I think we have a good example of single payer in the U.S., that works exceptionally well. It's called the VA. And uh, it's my understanding, and certainly it's been my experience, that the quality of care is better, the outcomes are better, and the costs are less. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Uh, well, if you'd had made that comment, Phil, about two or three months ago, I'd probably come closer to agreeing with you than all the appropriate publicity about poor care. I, 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 you know, there's... Any system has its administrative hangouts and stuff. Um, I'm probably going to disagree with you about the quality of care overall. In Austin, Texas, or Travis County, it's wonderful because they're good physicians taking care of it. They're committed to what's going on in most instances. But I think uh, is evidenced by these stories of waste and corruption. So I can't, I'd love to comment. I just don't know enough to except to make the whole point that it's not a man who was running for governor of Massachusetts, a guy named Dr. Don Berwick, B-E-R-W-C, who actually was head of, of the Medicare system in the U.S., but he was never confirmed by the Senate, so he never uh, was able to, be, to run it. But he ran for governor at Democratic uh, primary. Uh, he didn't get nominated. But his, his whole point was single-payer single for Massachusetts. 
uh, a Medicare type of thing. But it has its role. Exactly how to best present it is something that's something. But I don't think the VA is an optimal model because part of that is motivation. Yes, hi. Thank you. Uh, great lecture. Can you talk about how the entrance of some of the big retail players like Walmart into the healthcare uh, model could affect pricing? And on a related note, within the ACA, there's rules about uh, pricing transparency. They're due to kick in pretty soon, and how those could affect the prices that people pay. Do you mean when you talk about Walmart and stuff, the clinics they're providing or what they do for their employees? Uh, the clinics that they're sure. looking to provide. Yeah. Uh, one of the positive things I think that is moving forward in healthcare is what you're alluding to. There's the, what you call it, a doc in a box. But the point is, it's on the spot. Uh, you can go to several HEB stores here in Austin, certain Walmarts, where care is provided on the spot. Most of them actually are cash deals at this point. Some are doing insurance, but for a lot less. To a traditional physician, these are all staffed by uh, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, which are good. One of my sons is a physician's assistant, so it's not that I have anything. And they all work under protocols. But to answer your question, that is one model of future and may get more people actually going to the doctor at an appropriate time. So I think it will, it will play a major part in the future of healthcare is this sort of instant availability. Even uh, you can probably get an app to call Tom McCorris on Thursday afternoons and see what happens. So good trend for the future in my judgment, and I, but the details have to be worked out and you have to take care of quality. But it's the right direction, I think. Um, exactly a year ago, I became very immersed in all these plans through having to buy an individual policy for my daughter. And because of the chaos that was there up to the last minute, I elected to buy directly off the marketplace rather than go through the exchange, thinking that later I could maybe get her through the exchange. Um, given what you've said, how would you compare the, uh, shall we say, reliability of a marketplace policy versus an exchange policy in terms of where it's going to be accepted? And do you have information on how much they can raise the premiums from last year, this year, and each successive sure. year? Uh, again, there's never a perfect answer. and There'll be a small percentage of any of these things that don't apply. But the exchange policies versus the standard marketplace policies, basically they're both done by reliable companies and should be good. The key, of course, is the fine print, how much is covered. But again, the nice provision that I've mentioned so that certain services, mental health, drugs, are all covered under every policy you can find. Uh, so the direct answer to your question, they should be equal in terms of reliability and future. There are no guidelines or no restrictions, I should say, on how much the policy should go up. Lots of the predictions were that the policy premiums would go up significantly this second year. They have not. Uh, just about a 1% to 3% rise in most states is predicted for a lot of reasons that are beyond me. But the whole point is, so probably most of them will not, not go up significantly this year. Next year, who knows? Uh, but, but the reliability, back to your original question, should be equal. And, you know, you just have to look and, and check the prices. And, again, the keys are things like what is the deductible, what is the percentage paid, what's your copay when you go to the offices of the primary care versus the specialist. Those are the things that are so important to read and are hard to read sometimes, and particularly if you're not highly initiated in the world. Uh, a little bit of a plug for the kind of thing you're talking about that you went to the, the system to see how it worked is you can go to an actually insurance agent at no extra cost and can help you work your way through that in the private care market. And most of those folks, at least in Travis County, are pretty darn good. So it doesn't cost you any more. You get the added, quote, benefit of a professional advisor. But those are just your standard insurance agents who are selling health care insurance. Um, of, the, of the 8 million who did sign up for insurance, how many ended up losing it either because they didn't pay their premium, the difficulties with the ones with legal status, they never should have been enrolled in the first place, regardless of the reason why, how many ended up losing their coverage? Well, it's evidenced by her question. is some question that some of the people who were allowed to sign up didn't qualify and therefore are losing it, and there's this deadline that recently passed about their having to do. Uh, I don't only really have data except on those who pay the premiums, which say 85% of people, so 15% or thereabout, 
lost their insurance because they didn't continue to pay for it. The people who didn't qualify in reality, in other words, an administrative snag, uh, malfeasance, whatever word you want to use there, I don't have data on that at this point. And I think part of it's because it's not available yet because of what you said, this deadline has just passed. But so, so much importance to this. As, as I close, the key is the people who are new to the health insurance world need all sorts of help for those of us who've been battling it. So please, any chance you get to be helpful to somebody who's just gotten insurance, not that you know everything, but you know a whole lot more. Because some of these folks don't know what preventive care is. They don't know how to access the doctor. I mean, yeah, I've got an insurance card, but what the devil do I do with it now? I'm sorry, in church, I shouldn't say devil should. For those people that say they hate Obamacare, what would you say they're, that they don't understand about? It's a, it's a great question. I guess Bonnie asked me, what about Travis County? physicians, how do they feel about it? And I would say the majority of physicians are not in favor of it, but it's more this general sense that, hey, I'm being controlled. Hey, I'm not getting paid as much as I used to. So there are those kind of reasons. Uh, I think the good things about it, uh, to answer your question, are the fact that guaranteed insurability is probably the single biggest thing. The fact that basically, as a, as a society, we've decided to pay for the health care of a lot more people. We really have. So that part of Obamacare, I'm not going to get into the politics whether you think that's good or bad, but as a society, with this law, the, the federal government is paying for health care for a whole lot more people than it was two years ago or five years ago even. Uh, so that and, and the extension of benefits, the standardization of the fact that there are basic policy benefits that everybody's policy has to have, I think are the real pluses uh, for it and why I think the strengths. The, the, arguments about mandates and the lack of uh, reliability of some of the policies, not in the sense they're there, but what the person qualifies for them, uh, those are the real challenges. What we've done, remember I said the ethical imperative earlier that uh, mortality is higher amongst people who don't have health care insurance. Somebody's made reference to this country, you know, having, since we don't have universal coverage, uh, we've got a lot of people who fall in this category. The best example, of course, of that is the reference that's already been made to prenatal care or the lack of prenatal care, how that affects so much throughout our society. So I think the, the bottom line is learn what you can, ask the right questions, and uh, feel free to communicate with me uh, if I can ask you any questions either now or even later. Thank you, Dr. McCorse. This is so valuable, um, and, and to get the perspective of a practicing physician and a physician in a leadership position over many years and intimately involved with uh, championing indigent health care, we greatly appreciate your taking the time to come talk to us. Let's give him a big hand.